I'd like to acknowledge that I'm here in the Saskatoon Public Library downtown building, which was built and um, is on Treaty 6 territory land, the homeland of the Métis, and it's open and welcome to everybody. Everybody, uh, everyone in Saskatchewan is part of a treaty in some way or another, and the library definitely tries to fulfill our role as we understand it as a treaty organization. I think that's almost all of the Saskatoon Public Library um, things I need to say. My name is Megan. I'm a programming librarian here. Um, I will be handing it off very shortly to um, this is the Saskatchewan Environmental Society's Carol Chubb to introduce our speaker. Yeah. I don't think I've forgotten anything. So Carol, I will pass it over to you and you can introduce tonight's presenter. Good evening. Um, my name is Carol Chubb and I'm a volunteer with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The Environmental Society delivers community education and outreach, undertakes research and carries out demonstration projects that move us towards sustainability. It has been operating since 1970 and works on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. The, the current project is DPAVE. At Walter Murray Collegiate, some pavement is being replaced with trees and native plants. If you aren't already a member, we encourage you to join. You can find out more about our diverse projects activities and how to get involved at our website, www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to see receive an email notification of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series, you can send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The email address is info at environmentalsociety.ca. In your email message, ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series. Our speaker this evening is Lisa Howes. Lisa is a compost education coordinator at the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council. Many of us have learned how to compost food and yard waste from Lisa at the Gardenscape Show and elsewhere. Lisa is a graduate of Bedford Road Collegiate and she has a Bachelor of Arts degree with honors from the University of Saskatchewan in International Studies. She has experience in landscaping and in grounds maintenance work. Lisa has a keen interest in reducing waste, developing healthy soil, and caring for the environment. The title of Lisa's presentation is Considering Compost, Large and Small Scale Options. Go ahead, Lisa. Thank you, Carol. Um, yes, I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to uh, keep myself to the right time limit. Um, this is the first time I'm giving this particular presentation and I'm very excited about it, but that does mean it's a little bit untested. Um, so I'm going to be sharing my screen, first of all, to make sure that everybody can see what I'm seeing. There we go. And bring up my notes. Perfect, what a wonderful system. Okay, uh, and so I'm going to be going through uh, a few different things today. Here, let me just advance to the next slide, there we go. So basically the flow of my presentation is going to be, first I'm going to talk just a little bit, very quickly about the science of what actually are we talking about when we mention compost. Uh, then we're going to talk about why it matters as in what kind of environmental difference it makes. Uh, we're going to talk about what options exist for communities, and that's where we're really going to get into the pros and cons of small scale and large scale options, as well as draw a conclusion about what we recommend. Uh, and finally, we're going to look into 
What specifically uh, can each of us do, or can waste conscious citizens in particular do, to support community composting? Um, and then we will open it up for questions at the end. So uh, without further ado, here we go. So compost, we're all probably familiar with it as a concept in general, uh, but there's not always a, a super strong understanding of uh, the um, biological processes that are happening on the under the surface. So what is actually going on is it's a kind of aerobic decomposition, which is to say things, um, organic molecules are breaking down using oxygen. Uh, so it's aerobic decomposition and it is performed mostly by microbes. This is a biological process. It cannot be done without a whole host of living organisms uh, using their enzymes to dissolve and remake a whole bunch of organic bonds. So the main ones that we're dealing with are bacteria and fungus or fungi uh, in, in absolutely amazing multitudes and, and great proliferation in a compost pile uh, of uh, all different kinds. Although, of course, we are, again, looking to mostly have aerobic species and not the type of species that function well in an oxygen starved environment. Um, this Sorry, these bacteria and fungi are the primary ones doing things in the compost, but there is a much wider web of organisms present, especially in really rich, really healthy compost. There tends to be a whole lot of larger things, uh, higher trophic levels like protozoa and nematodes and bugs or arthropods, uh, which reflects the same ecosystem, which is found in living healthy soil. Uh, because what compost is doing is it is replicating the uh, the decomposition and nutrient cycling function that is already occurring in healthy, healthy soils naturally. All of these decomposition microbes exist all over the place in nature, and they are, of course, constantly breaking down organic litter from trees and grass and plants and everything else that is out there living in the world. Uh, just as a, a super quick picture here, um, a few of me may look at this and immediately think, ah, Elaine Ingham, and you're correct. There's, um, <laughs> this is a fairly famous uh, soil food web um, a uh, picture that was uh, tied to the work of Dr. Elaine Ingham, who was really, really foundational in sort of the modern understanding of what healthy soil looks like. But basically, the things we're expecting to see in compost are organic matter, bacteria, fungus, protozoa, whole bunch of nematodes, and arthropods, which is the fancy name for bugs. And all of these guys are working together to break things down. The larger things, like the bugs, are mostly working on shredding materials and getting them into smaller pieces. Uh, the nematodes are uh, mixing and shredding as well. And then the bacteria and fungi are working on the small scale, sort of uh, almost the chemical level. So. All of this is what's happening in compost. We're having aerobic decomposition, uh, primarily performed by microbes, and we are breaking down any kind of organic matter into mature compost. And that is to say, mature or finished compost. Uh, we usually recognize it by being brown, crumbly, and having the earthy smell of uh, the same as he nice, healthy garden soil, rather than anything sour or um, manure-like which is an indication of, of ammonia. Uh, so we want it to smell like earth. We want it to be brown and crumbly. We want the majority of things to be unrecognizable, although some woody bits will be present. And what we're actually looking at here from a biological perspective is that this is a relatively stable mix. So there's not a whole lot of additional decomposition happening, although there is a little bit all the time, but a relatively stable mix of humus, which is a very stable form of organic matter, living organisms, and their exudates. Oh, I'm my picture is over top of my notes. One second here. Let me find a better place to put my face on my screen. There we go. So exudates is just a another fancy scientific word, this one to mean basically all of the various things that the bacteria and the fungi happen to spit out. Enzymes, waste products, etc. cetera. Uh, I have heard other folks um, occasionally refer to it simply as uh, the microbial goo. And it is surprisingly important in healthy soil because it sort of acts like glue that holds a bunch of things together. But anyway, so finished compost, humus, living organisms, and their, uh, uh, their waste products. <laughs> okay, so that's a very quick go through of what is compost and what are we looking for? Oh, I guess part of why I actually brought this up is to, to clarify that um, 
There are cases where things that are advertised as compost or things that are claimed to be composters don't actually go through the microbial process and don't arrive at this finished end state. Um, there are, for example, countertop compo count composters, countertop composters uh, that really actually just um, cook uh, sterilize, pulverize, and dehydrate food to make it into sort of a stable form of food powder. And while that can be useful for storage or to use it elsewhere or to make it easier to transport, that's not compost because uh, it hasn't been transformed into this form uh, uh, of humus living organisms and their exudates, which is what we need if we're planning to actually aid plants and build healthy soil. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about what are the specific environmental benefits uh, or issues surrounding compost beyond it just being sort of a, a nice green thing to do? What are we actually trying to accomplish? And it really breaks down into these three areas. The first being simply waste reduction, literally just making less garbage and all, everything that um, cascades from there. The second one, and this is where we'll get really into talking about mitigating climate change is avoiding methane pollution. And the third and final one, which is less well known, but it can be very, very exciting and hopeful if you dig into it, uh, dig into it, I guess that's a pun technically, is um, carbon sequestration uh, in the form of building healthy soil. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. Before I dig into these three though, I do wanna take a minute to uh, just point out that um, composting isn't necessarily the goal when it comes to dealing with organic waste, or that is to say, when it comes to dealing with things that used to be food in particular, there's actually kind of a food recovery hierarchy uh, that's um, used, and you can find it in many different forms for many different major organizations all over the United States and Canada and elsewhere. But it tends to talk about when we're dealing with food, first, we want to avoid wasting it in the first place, which means better storage, uh, better transport, uh, better planning um, and, and just less of it being left to, to uh, spoil. And secondly, uh, if there is extra food to get it donated to other hungry humans, if at all possible, rather than it going in the trash. So it's being sent to um, uh, soup kitchens and shelters that are putting out hot meals, uh, going to the food bank, things like this. Then if it's not quite fit for human consumption, but it is still usable, the next goal down, uh, the next best thing would be if possible to feed it to animals who could use it like pigs uh, or sheep, goats, cows, chickens, uh, and sort of uh, put it back into the food cycle that way. And only after we've dealt with reducing waste at the source, donating it to other hungry people and donating it to hungry animals, do we look at composting? So I'm not trying to say that composting is the absolute best thing to do with organic waste, but once we've dealt with these other three uh, options, composting is generally what's left. And sometimes also equivalent to composting, you'll see people using organic waste for anaerobic uh, digestion, which is deliberately creating methane in order to burn it as biogas, so a form of electricity. Uh, and then usually the digestate is actually composted at the end of that anyway. Anaerobic digestion so far isn't really a big deal in Saskatchewan. To be honest, we just don't have the kind of um, population density that's necessary to make it um, more economically viable. So you see it more in places like Ontario. Uh, and then finally, if we absolutely don't manage to do anything with it, well, then things tend to just end up at the landfill or incinerated, which is the worst case scenario. So. Thank you for letting me take a minute on that. Back to the specific benefits of composting. So a really big, really obvious one is waste reduction. Um, I will admit most of my hard data on this comes from the city of Saskatoon in particular. Uh, they have a lot of publicly accessible, uh, very detailed waste audits um, going back many years, uh, which makes it really easy to get really good statistics from them. Um, According to the literature, these are also broadly true for other municipalities across Canada, but I'm sure that there would be some variation from place to place. Uh, I would even be interested in just getting the numbers from Regina or Moose Jaw or North Battleford or Prince Albert's just to have a little bit more of a, uh, a reference point. But for the moment, I am working mostly with the numbers from Saskatoon. Um, so the number on the left here, the what's in our trash graphic, this is actually from a 2016 
uh, waste survey from Saskatoon. And I do also have, which you'll see in the next slides, um, some 2019 data, so a little bit more recent. Um, but they were finding that in a, a single family household, uh, with single residence household, single family, single family residence. Uh, so like a detached house, basically, not an apartment or a condo, uh, but a detached house. And this is not a summertime peak, but a yearly average 58% of what was being thrown away in the black bin as garbage was actually organics that could have been composted instead, especially uh, food scraps and yard waste. So clearly taking that out would have left them with only 42% as much garbage, which if you're looking very closely, you could see it could be further reduced with a little more uh, thorough recycling and uh, hazardous waste reduction. Um, but the point being that this big portion of residential waste, um, the, the, the rule of thumb across the board that you'll see cited over and over and over again in the literature is that about half of uh, the municipal rice stream tends to be organics. Uh, and so taking that out means a lot less garbage, which has the cascading effects of things like not needing to have as frequent garbage pickup, which means um, less traffic uh, and, and less exhaust, less gas burned by the garbage trucks. It also means that the existing landfills and transfer stations uh, don't fill up as quickly, which is especially important for the landfills. Uh, it can save money at the transfer, transfer stations, but the, the point being with the landfills that the slower they fill up, the longer it will be before they need to be closed, decommissioned, and have an entirely new landfill sited somewhere else, which is both a massively expensive endeavor and also takes up a lot of land uh, for a not terribly environmentally friendly purpose. Um, so waste reduction is a big and significant part of dealing with organics, which is usually in the form of composting. Um, so just going to, there we go, okay. So this is from the 2019 Saskatoon Waste Characterization Study, which is also freely available online. If you, if you Google for 2019, City of Saskatoon Waste Characterization Study, it will come up as a PDF. Um, but I'm just bringing up a few numbers to back up what I'm saying here. So for a single family residential curbside garbage composition, lots of words to say family in a house with a garbage can, their garbage can was uh, about 53 or 54% organic waste uh, over to the, the course of 2019. For multi-unit residential waste, so this is something like from an apartment or a condominium, uh, it's a little lower because people have a lot less outdoor space that they're dealing with, but it still actually manages to be about 40%, uh, most of which is food waste and organics of that type. Um, and finally, they did actually also include some numbers from uh, the non-residential waste stream, which is often uh, kind of pushed to a back burner or forgotten about in numbers like this. Um, they didn't make it into quite as nice of a pie chart, which, you know, fair enough, I guess they only have so much money for, uh, for making nice graphics, but um, for the, this is, this particular graphic is showing uh, several different foods, um, sorry, businesses that are in the accommodation or food service uh, area of the economy. So everything from restaurants to hotels, uh, things like that, to grocery stores. And the green portion is the portion of their garbage that was organic. Um, so you can see we're ranging all the way from about 81% to some of them up to only about 44% only about for others. Um, but this is an enormous chunk of the waste stream in municipal areas is coming from, um, it's, we often call it ICI, which is industries, commercial buildings, and institutions. Uh, and um, elsewhere in the report, they didn't have a perfect graphic to represent it, but elsewhere in the report, they mentioned that the average amount of um, organic material uh, across the entire retail sector was about 41% of the waste stream. So again, hovering around that half mark, which tends to be sort of where organics fall. So taking that out can be very, very helpful for um, both reducing the amount of trucks on the road and for making sure that our landfill is lasting longer and not filling up with trash so fast. 
This also gives you an idea of sort of the volumes we're talking about when we get into the second environmental uh, issue that we are looking at, which is avoiding methane pollution. So when organic matter, let us say, well, there's different ways to say it, things that were once alive, or if you want to be more scientific, things that have organic carbon-based molecules, um, although what we're usually dealing with is yard waste and food waste, when they decompose, they really have two biological options uh, for how they break down. Either they can undergo aerobic decomposition, which is to say they can compost. And that requires that there is oxygen present. There has to be oxygen available or aerobic decomposition can't happen. If things are breaking down in an oxygen starved environment where there's very little fresh oxygen available, uh, we end up seeing anaerobic decomposition, which is what we do get in landfills because things are tightly, tightly packed down and deeply covered up. Uh, anaerobic decomposition also relies on microbes, uh, primarily bacteria in particular, but uh, they're using a different biological process to break things down and it isn't as clean, basically. It takes longer. Uh, a, for example, there have been studies done where people have taken core samples out of landfills to sort of check how things from previous decades are doing in there. And they found that it can actually take about 20 years for a head of lettuce to fully break down in a landfill uh, to the point that it's unrecognizable. So it takes a very long time for things to break down there. And the entire time that they are going through this anaerobic decomposition, they are letting out methane and some other byproducts as well, things like um, ammonia and things like hydrogen sulfide gas. But the one that we really focus on is the methane. So, um, methane, uh, as many of you probably already know, is a greenhouse gas, and it's somewhat different from carbon dioxide in that um, while it doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long before it tends to be cycled out, uh, it has far, far more warming potential than carbon dioxide. So there's two different numbers that you may have heard. You may have heard people talking about methane being 80 times uh, having 80 times more warming power than carbon dioxide. Or you may have heard people talking about it having 25 times as much warming power as carbon dioxide. The interesting thing is both of these numbers are actually true. It just depends what time scale you're looking at. Uh, methane provides a very strong, very short burst of warming ability. So if you're looking at it in just like the next 10 years, that's when it has the 80 times warming power. And if you're looking at it over a century, it's 25. Uh, either way, it's a lot, um, and uh, at least according to uh, the Environmental Defense Fund from the United States, from their website, um, uh, they mentioned that at least 25% of today's warming is driven by methane from human actions. So it is not an insignificant source of climate change, and it is absolutely something that is worth focusing on. Um, the more organic waste we can keep out of oxygen starved environments primarily like landfills and put into um, composting systems or uh, anaerobic digesters or any other system that specifically either captures that methane or avoids making it in the first place the better it is going to be for uh for the planet and for us um yes yeah i think that was everything i wanted to say about that. Um, the third thing, which is interestingly enough also related to climate change, uh, is the final benefit of composting, which is building healthy soil. Uh, so some of you may already be familiar with the way that building healthy soil is interrelated with mitigating climate change, and some of you may have not heard of it before. Uh, but basically, the well, first, I'm going to talk about uh, what is healthy soil made of. So healthy soil is composed of rock dust, water, air, organic matter, and living organisms. Um, and the organic matter and living organisms portion in healthy soil is actually not that big. It only tends to range between about five and 10%, even in the most lovely rich soils in the world. Um, however, over the amount of dirt that exists on the planet, uh, this holds an absolutely staggering amount of carbon in the forms of biomass. Um, 
And uh, the important point to understand there is that organic matter is the part of soil that tends to get the most depleted through human activity and large scale agriculture. So basically, if we have been doing intensive monoculture agriculture in the same place for a long time, chances are that organic matter portion of the soil has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Um, if we haven't been doing things to specifically try to build it up and, uh, and, and enrich it again. And so if you're thinking about carbon as a cycle, what that means is that a whole lot of carbon that used to be locked up in the dirt now isn't. And we want to change that. <laughs> um, also, so yeah, the organic matter and living organisms in the soil perform several really, really crucial roles for keeping the soil healthy. I'm just touching the surface here. There's actually, you can get whole PhDs in um, uh, soil biology and um, and and uh, soil carbon content, but um, the organic matter in soil and the living organisms in it create a healthy soil texture by forming aggregates. Basically, they help take little tiny fine particles of soil and clump them up into slightly larger, slightly lumpier bits, which helps air and water and so and roots to percolate through the soil. Uh, they are the ones that are cycling nutrients back into a form usable by plants. So every time a tree dies or a flower dies or a cow dies, they are the ones responsible for making sure that all of the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other micronutrients in that uh, living organism, de dead organism, are able to get back into a form that can be reused. The living um, organisms in soil also filter and break down pollutants. And then the thing that I hinted at before, one of the most important things that they do is that they hold and store carbon in their own biomass. So, um, I don't have either the time or, to be honest, the expertise to give a really good overview of carbon farming today, uh, but in short, the field of study that ranges around how to increase the organic carbon in the soil uh, and to use that as a way to mitigate climate change is typically called carbon farming. And you can find several different large agricultural uh, and, and climate change organizations that are working on this. One really good one in particular uh, is at carboncycle.org. And the idea is to create a positive spiral of increasing soil carbon content or, or carbon sequestration uh, through careful management practices like compost application, cover crops, mulching, uh, growing windbreaks, and, and more. Um, and they have found, especially in uh, semi-arid rangeland and, and previous agricultural monocultures, that they can sequester again, I mean, not enough to completely undo all of climate change, but enough to make a very significant difference. They can sequester an enormous amount of carbon into the ground. Um, which is a very, very helpful place to put it. Uh, the, the, the mechanism by which this happens is first they build up the healthiness of the soil, which increases uh, the, the liveliness and healthiness of the plants. And the plants, of course, are always performing photosynthesis, which uses carbon dioxide uh, and, and breaks the carbon and oxygen um, apart. And much of that is turned into sugars, which are then pumped into the soil and eaten by the living organisms there. So it's basically using plants as a pump to move carbon from the air to the dirt uh, by changing the ways that we um, manage the dirt. So a lot of words, a lot of words very quickly, but to explain the things we care about for compost are making less garbage, avoiding methane pollution, and using it to trap more carbon in the soil. Okay. Now, now I'm gonna talk about what options exist for communities. If you are a small town, if you are a big city, if you are a little RM, what can you do with your organics to try to keep them out of the landfill? The two major categories that the solutions tend to get broken into, um, oh, assuming your solution is composting, again, there are some other things people tend to do like feeding animals or anaerobic digestion or other things, but assuming that composting is the route that you're going, things tend to break into two major categories, which is either small-scale on-site composting and education programs around that, or large-scale municipal commercial composting, which is curbside pickup or drop-off depots where very large amounts of organic matter are dealt with all at once. So, small-scale composting. 
this is actually, this is my bread and butter. Uh, this is the subject that takes up 90% of all of my working days uh, because uh, at my work with the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council, most of what I do is actually around public education for small scale composting, especially through the Saskatoon Compost Coach Program. So I am a little biased, but I'm also going to do my absolute best to be really straightforward about both uh, what small scale composting can do really well and what it can't do really well because it does have pros and cons in terms of things that it does really, really well. Um, one thing is that composting is fairly simple and accessible. Uh, you don't need any sort of complicated setup. You don't need any um, uh, high tech materials to make compost because it simply relies on uh, the blend of decomposition microbes that are already present pretty much everywhere on the surface of the earth. It really is just a matter of uh, creating decent working conditions for the existing microbes and then just getting out of the way to let them do their thing. So if they, the compost needs to be damp, Ideally, the compost needs to have a mix of uh, carbon and nitrogen, if possible. Uh, the compost needs oxygen, and then everything else is done for us. So it, it's, it's a very simple process, and it can be done at a variety of scales as well. You can make compost in a very small pile, you can make compost in a very large pile, and of course you can make compost on an industrial scale. So for this reason, it's much simpler than say, trying to recycle your own plastic or trying to melt down and reforge your own metal or something like that. Um, but while it is a very simple, very scalable, very accessible technology, it also doesn't fit very well with everyone's uh, household or lifestyle. Uh, it's great in particular for gardeners. It's good for people who have an outdoor space such as the yard. It can be done in apartments and condominiums. There are indoor ways to compost, things like vermicompost and bokashi fermentation. Um, but it's both harder to do and people have less of a reason to do it uh, if they don't have an outdoor space to use the finished compost on. And finally, it's pretty difficult to do at all in most businesses, institutions, and industries, uh, most of which don't have either the space or, or the manpower or even the knowledge to figure out how to compost on site. Uh, I kind of skipped ahead to the cons list there, but okay, so <laughs> back to positives. Um, so it's simple and accessible for many people, but not all people. There's no uh, collection or transport necessary, which makes it extremely cost effective for municipalities. Um, and it also means that you're not adding to um, uh, emissions through uh, more trucks on the road or having to make a bunch more plastic bins or anything like that. And uh, finally, this does encourage people to, to use the finished compost. When people compost at home, uh, it tends to lead them into then using the compost in their own local green spaces in their backyard or a community garden uh, to build up that healthy soil, increase the soil carbon, and um, sometimes also increase the biodiversity or just the general biomass of their space. They, it helps them to build um, greener outdoor areas. Uh, so it's very good for that reason. It's, it's, it's a very direct loop of nutrients from a household back into the dirt of that household. Uh, but the cons being again, uh, that it's not accessible or doesn't work very well for everyone. And in particular, actually this really is the biggest thing. Uh, the last check from Saskatoon and oh gosh, I'm forgetting which waste study this particular statistic came from. I should have dug that up before today, but uh, the last check of Saskatoon was that about 31% of households do some kind of composting at home, which is great, but of course that, that leaves out the other two thirds of Saskatoon. And um, I would suspect there would be similar, varying, but similar proportions across all of Saskatchewan and Canada more generally, that you will always have a chunk of people who are absolutely composting uh, at home and it's good for them and it works well and it keeps the organics out of the garbage. But you're also, if you're relying on home composting, you're going to have a solid majority who don't. Um, a second thing about home composting is that there are some types of organic waste that it is difficult to handle in a home compost bin, trench, etc. It's hard to compost trees and wood waste. 
if you have several downed branches from a spruce tree, unless you have a really good wood chipper on ho at home on site, uh, it will be very difficult to get that all the way broken down into finished compost because wood is such a persistent material and bulky material. Uh, it's hard to compost greasy and protein rich food waste at home because these things tend to cause odor problems and also attract animals. Generally in a home compost bin, we ask people to stick to primarily plant-based wastes that don't have a lot of grease, uh, as well as eggshells are okay too. But for example, we wouldn't want people composting um, spoiled meat or uh, curdled milk or uh, a whole lot of uh, used fryer oil or anything like that because it would have a very powerful odor and it would probably bring animals as well. Um, it's difficult for people to compost aggressive weeds and diseased plants because they're worried about whether their finished compost will still have some of that material in it and if they will be then spreading those aggressive weeds or those diseases to other places in their own green space. And finally, it can be difficult and dangerous to compost things like dog waste, cat waste, human manure, or biosolids, uh, all things that could have pathogens or, or parasites in them that can make us sick. Because in a home compost bin, it's very difficult to ensure that you will get the kind of high temperatures that will sterilize, well, not sterilize, but kill the pathogens and make those things safe. Um, by the way, the rule of thumb in general, if you're wanting to compost something that might have something nasty in it, like E. coli or salmonella, is that you need it to get up to at least 55 degrees Celsius for at least 48 hours through all parts of the compost in order to kill those pathogens, which doesn't usually happen in a home compost. So again, it's accessible, it's cheap, it's a very direct, small-scale nutrient loop that can encourage people to really think about and grow their own green spaces, but it doesn't work for everyone and it doesn't work for everything. So that's when we start thinking about large-scale composting. Uh, there's two different major ways large-scale composting can look. Uh, curbside pickup is often the thing we think of, which is just next to your black bin and hopefully your blue bin, you now also have a green bin where you can put all of your food waste and yard waste and soiled paper and depending on your uh, specific municipality, sometimes even other things too. Basically anything that's got an organic carbon-based molecule and is gonna break down. Um, or the second option being depots. Uh, these are usually just drop-off areas where people can voluntarily take organic waste and leave it either for free or for, for a small fee. Um, the compost depots are quite common around Saskatchewan. Curbside pickup is slightly less common. Um, depots tend to handle a lot more yard waste, a lot more outdoor wood waste, grass waste, uh, weeds and leaves and a lot less of the actual food waste and a lot less of the organic waste from um, ICI or industrial commercial institutional waste. So they catch a lot of the residential yard waste but not a lot else. Okay so the cons of large-scale composting programs the first and most obvious one is that they require significant municipal investment up front. Uh, you need, um, generally, you're going, okay, let's assume we're talking about curbside pickup in particular, then you need a whole new rollout of organic bins that are uh, well marked and uh, visually distinct from the other ones. You need a series, a set of trucks that is able to pick up the organic bins and they have to be watertight so that they're not letting drippings get out onto the ground as they're driving around. Um, you need a whole lot of public education so that people know how to use the green carts. Uh, and you also need a compost site, some sort of large scale place where you are managing the groundwater and you have a plan for aeration and you have enough space and you have ways to mitigate smells and animals. So while it is 100% possible, and in fact, three quarters of, of uh, Actually, no, I'll get into that later because that, that statistic's not quite as hard as I'm making it sound. It's totally possible and it is common in Saskatchewan for there to be large scale composting programs, but setting them up is a significant amount of work. However, this may be offset. These costs may be offset in the long term 
by what people are saving on landfill space. So again, I mentioned before that when landfills fill up, it is a enormously expensive proposition uh, for municipalities to close their own landfill and site and open a new one. Um, I believe the last number thrown around in Saskatoon was something around $125 million is what's projected as the general cost for doing that. Uh, and even for municipalities that don't have a landfill, which is most of them in Saskatchewan, but are using a transfer station instead, uh, just the cost of operating and constantly getting the transfer station emptied uh, of garbage can also be very significant. So it takes a lot of money to set up a compost program, although it may pay for itself over time, um, similar to, you know, putting up solar panels or something like that. Uh, but that is a con and then it puts it out of reach of uh, a fair number of places. It also, it does involve still pickup transport and moving things, which means that you are burning gas and making emissions to move materials around. Uh, and organic waste does tend to be quite heavy in particular, a lot of it is water. Um, and uh, uh, two more things quickly as cons. One, it's hard to put this <laughs> into polite words. Um, Municipal large scale composting like curbside pickup programs are very visible and they may be uh, contentious or unpopular. Um, politicians can face a lot of local backlash uh, when they're trying to implement an organics pickup program for the first time because people don't like them. <laughs> I mean, they might like them eventually or they might come around to them, but when they're first being put in place, um, people generally are, they're annoyed by having another cart. They're annoyed by the perception that this is going to be costing them more money through their taxes. Um, and uh, they're just sort of generally annoyed by feeling like this is just one more thing that they are required to do. Uh, and so there may actually be more anti-environmental backlash around composting programs, large scale composting programs than we see around uh, education programs focused on small scale home composting. Uh, and, and finally, somewhat related to that, is that uh, there's not as much of a bond with the finished compost when people are sending their organic waste away into a large scale program. Um, rather than like as a home composter, people are generally making compost, get finished compost, and then get a chance to use that finished compost on their own space. So it's sort of a direct um, pipeline to it being back in the soil. Uh, whereas at least in Saskatchewan, and now this is really interesting as, a, uh, as an agricultural province, um, a lot of the finished compost for municipal, big municipal compost depots actually ends up just being left to sit and isn't used um, because there's a surprisingly, it's surprisingly difficult to make sure that there's actually a destination for all of the finished compost, the finished mature compost being made by all of this uh, municipal organics that's being picked up. Um, uh, in so uh, data from a Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council survey done earlier in 2021, which um, it, they had 247 municipalities self-reporting. Uh, so that's not everyone in Saskatchewan, but it is a fair chunk of the people who are out there. Three quarters of them do have some kind of composting program. One quarter have nothing. Um, but of that three quarters that have a composting program, uh, about three quarters of them just have a drop off depot of some kind. Only about one quarter have pickup. Um, however, the main thing that I wanted to talk about is that how is it used? This was the most interesting part of the survey. So, of those that responded, 29% said they gave it away, which means uh, that at least it's getting used, even if um, the sheer value of finished compost is maybe not being respected there, but at least it's being used. 12% were able to sell it, 25% used it internally, uh, and uh, the remaining chunk, which was um, just a little under half, uh, did nothing with it, and it was literally just sitting there and building up, and they didn't have a plan for where it was going to go. So that can be kind of an unfortunate... Um, kind of stagnation that can happen in large scale composting is that there's not always a good plan for, okay, how are we going to make sure this finished compost is getting back into the soil somewhere once we're done with it? Um, so I, I've, I've, I've gone on the cons a lot, that it costs money, that it requires a bunch of infrastructure, that you need to figure out how you're actually going to make sure that the finished compost goes somewhere. But all of this can be um, potentially outweighed by the one major enormous pro, which is that large-scale composting diverts and catches 
way, way more organic waste than home composting alone. Not only does it catch um, the compost from all of the households that for whatever reason don't want to or can't compost at home, it also catches the kinds of waste people can't compost at home, like trees, uh, um, meaty kitchen scraps, diseased plants, uh, and sometimes, depending on the system, things like dog waste and cat waste. And finally, large-scale composting programs also have the potential to capture the whole industrial, commercial, and institutional chunk of the organic stream. So it's harder, it's more expensive, it can be more contentious, and it's overall, it's just effective at a larger scale. Um, and again, this is coming from me, a person who spends pretty much all of my time uh, doing public education on small scale on site home composting. So what is the best then? We're, we're to the end, not the end of my presentation, but um, let me just check the time. I think I'm pretty on time. Um, yeah, you're doing good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm loving it so far, so keep okay. going. Um, so what conclusion can we draw from this? Ultimately, uh, it's the opinion of the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council that what's best is a hybrid system, to have some of both. Um, ultimately, it does seem that it's really important to have some kind of large-scale composting available, whether or not uh, that is directly done by the municipality or it's the munici municipality and other uh, ICI actors um, contracting some sort of large-scale commercial composter. It seems like if we really want to keep organics out of the landfill, we have to have some kind of a large program like that to do it. But it is also really valuable to still have some form of support or to encourage small scale on site home composting, especially for the people that it fits well for, especially for the things that are fairly easy to compost at home, um, both because it keeps people understanding the importance of composting and why we're trying to do it, and because of the way it encourages people to use the finished compost in their own green spaces and uh, do a little bit of carbon farming of their own, basically. Um, also, any of the organic waste that's dealt with in the uh, in a on small scale on site composting doesn't have to go through the whole getting picked up, being transported, being dealt with, and then being shipped out on the industrial scale. So basically, having some of both does seem to be the best of both worlds. Although we also want to acknowledge that not every community in Saskatchewan currently has the resources to do any kind of large scale composting. Um, it does take startup money. So that is the overall conclusion that we have come to, uh, which is really interesting, or is going to be very interesting next year in particular for the city of Saskatoon, or for the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council watching the city of Saskatoon, uh, because next year is the year that they plan to do their big rollout of their completely revamped organics program. So it's going to be going from a um, sub totally optional subscription-based opt-in green cart system, which is currently used by about nine, ten percent of the eligible households in Saskatoon, uh, to something that is like the like the recycling program is 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 mandatory and citywide for both uh, single family residences and multifamily residences, and ultimately eventually for all of the ICI sector. So, um, and a lot of the pros and cons that I've talked about are already being visible, especially the one of it being publicly contentious uh, and there being a little bit of backlash about it. Um, but at the same time, the reason the city of Saskatoon really has to do this is because uh, they are trying to preserve the life of the landfill and meet their own climate change uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets. And they, they, it's one of the big things that they really have to do to prove they're serious. Um, we do still have home scale educate, home composting small scale education uh, available in Saskatoon as well. Um, and the city has said that they're going to continue to support it. So we might be looking at a hybrid system here. Um, we are really interested to also see what's going on or, or what moves out of the organics pilot co organics collection pilot program that's been going on in Regina over the last year. Um, it's going into a larger rollout soon and to continue to keep in touch with and find out more about and, and work with other municipalities, big ones like Moose John, Prince Albert and North Battleford and really small ones too, uh, to, to see what else can be done around the province and then how we can all work on this particular issue. 
Okay, so the last part here, what can waste conscious citizens do to support community composting? So I'm going to go through each of these points uh, fairly quickly, and then we'll open it up for questions. We should be ready for questions by 8 p.m. So first of all, composting at home. If it fits with your space, if you've got the space for it and your lifestyle, you've got the time and the mental space for it, uh, composting at home is a really good thing to do. Uh, it will take direct control of keeping your organics out of the garbage and out of the landfill. Um, and it also can encourage you to grow a little bit of your own green space or do a little bit of your own carbon farming right in your own backyard. Uh, if you are interested in this, the SWC has many free resources available teaching about different kinds of home composting. You can find them on our website. Here's just one of our little graphics, uh, but we have a lot of stuff there on um, everything from using a bin to composting in a trench to vermicomposting indoors, bokashi composting and, and more. And of course, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us about them as well. We're really happy to share our, uh, the composting education resources that we have because the more people use them, the more effective they are. So home composting is a really good way to keep organics out of your waste stream, avoid that methane and sequester some carbon in the soil. Another thing you can do, is to generally support large-scale composting programs and the politicians who are putting them forward. I mentioned how they tend to be contentious. To be fair, to be fair, um, as somebody from the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council, I feel like I can say this because we see it all the time. As a rule, changes to any kind of waste collection program are unpopular, whether you're changing the shape of the garbage bin or the day that the recycling is picked up or you're switching what's allowed to go into the recycling bin. Basically, people do not like it uh, in general when you mess with their waste collection programs. And so we've actually never seen a change to a waste collection program of any kind that has been popular at the time of implementation. And the real uh, the real test is finding out how people feel about it in about five years. Um, but even if, uh, if you disagree with the specific kind of composting being proposed, or you think there's an issue with where it's being cited or how it's being picked up, that's all fine. But it really does help for uh, local politicians and provincial politicians to be able to hear that people care about organics and they care about uh, avoiding methane pollution. And they are interested in finding more ways uh, to make sure that organic waste is put into something useful and decompose aerobically and doesn't make methane. Um, and to know that just, there are vocal supporters of this as well as vocal detractors. So um, yeah, speak up, make yourself known if, if, you, if, if you support them. And secondly, support businesses. Or thirdly, sorry, this is the third point. Support businesses that compost. So in spite of it not being mandatory and uh, uh, not anywhere in Saskatchewan, as far as I know, and, and that could be wrong. As far as I know, not mandatory anywhere in Saskatchewan. Uh, and in spite of in some places, they're not even being commercial um, companies available to contract for this. It's a surprising number of small businesses that still do their part as best they can to divert their organic waste and make sure that it ends up in a compost somewhere or fed to a local pig farmer's pigs or something like that, that uh, out throughout the course of their day, they separate out their organic waste and then they go out of their way to make the arrangements to figure out where it's gonna go and how it's gonna get used to make sure it doesn't go in the trash can. If you know small businesses that are doing this in your community, in your area, support them. Both either uh, go, you know, and buy some of their stuff, vote with your dollars, or just tell them that you notice and that you care uh, because it can make a really big difference to people. Sometimes larger places do this as well. We'd love to see more composting and organics diversion happening in big grocery stores uh, and restaurant chains and stuff like that. Um, so anytime you see it, support it. And now the last point, and I'm going to do my absolute best not to get stuck in a rant right here, not to end the night on a whole rant. Um, I've written recognize greenwashing as my fourth and final point and how to support things. Uh, but honestly, what I really mean about that is to think carefully about uh, compostable disposable products and when they are and aren't helpful or when they're just more of a distraction. 
In particular, uh, in the last 10 years, there's been an explosion in compostable plastics. Um, and they're, you'll see them used in everything from uh, compostable, uh, disposable plastic cutlery and compostable uh, plastic soup lids from restaurants and is in this picture, disposable plastic chip packets or other sorts of food wrappers. And it can be, uh, it can be easy for the average person to feel like just because if something says compostable on it, it must be helpful or it must be doing something good. Um, but the truth is the, the actual utility of compostable plastic is fairly limited. And, and I'll mention why. The biggest thing is that compostable plastic, while it can break down under the right circumstances completely, leaving nothing behind, no plastic particles, just carbon dioxide and water, um, it does take specific circumstances to get there. In particular, it usually needs to be in a very hot environment, a very hot and wet environment for several weeks, which you can get in a big industrial compost, but you do not tend to get that in a home compost bin. So one of the biggest things about compostable plastics is that they are very poor for home composting and don't tend to actually break down. And in fact, may negatively affect people's home composting experience because if they're using compostable plastic liners for their compost bin or something like that, uh, and then their finished compost is full of shreds of green plastic, they may be so frustrated that they stop. Um, at the same time as well, when it comes to restaurants and stuff like that, if they have if they switch all of their soup cups over to compostable soup cups, that's only helpful if they also have some sort of a program collecting those compostable soup cups and getting them into a industrial compost system that can handle them. Compostable plastics and other compostable products that are sent to the landfill are just becoming more organic waste to break down in the landfill and make methane. They're not actually doing anything helpful. So um, Basically, if a bag of garbage is headed to the landfill, it's better for that bag of garbage to be in a regular plastic bag than a compostable plastic bag because uh, the second one actually doesn't cause any benefit and may cause harm in the terms of just adding more degradable material that can also eventually produce methane. Um, I promise this wouldn't be a rant, so I'm gonna cut it off here. But basically all I'm trying to say is, while there are circumstances that compostable plastics can be useful, they basically have to be ones where they are being collected and sent to a specific large scale compost facility that accepts them and knows how to deal with them. Otherwise, I think people should stick to things that are either reusable or things that are easily compostable like paper plates or, or um, wooden chopsticks. Yeah, So and so to keep an eye out for businesses and companies that are making steps to be more sustainable, but actually not really accomplishing anything. <laughs> yeah, but up, up. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. If you still have questions, and honestly, I hope you still have questions, uh, A, we'll have our question period now, but also I highly encourage you to contact the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council after this presentation for more information about composting all over Saskatchewan and in the prairies more generally. Here's our phone number, our email, and our website, and we would love to hear from you. Thanks.